The Nigerian Naira has witnessed a steady decline since the present government announced the removal of fuel subsidy. It has lost more than 40% value against the US dollar in about five months of implementing the policy, the most significant drop in its history. This crisis has caused unprecedented economic uncertainty and hardship in the country. Prices of goods and services have gone off the roof, fuel price has more than doubled, and the inflation rate is at an all-time high. Nigerians paying international school fees and medical bills abroad now know that the rich also cry. Everybody in Nigeria is feeling the pinch in one way or another. However, the fall of the Naira did not start with the present government. It began the nosedive in 1983 and has not ameliorated. As at then, one US dollar was exchanged for about 72 kobo. In 1990, it fell to about 9 Naira to one US dollar. In the year 2000, one US dollar was exchanged for about 85 Naira at the official window. In 2010, one US dollar was exchanged for about 150 Naira officially, while in the 2010s, the Naira experienced several devaluations partly due to oil price volatility and economic challenges. And in 2020, one US dollar exchanged for about 360 Naira in the official window. In recent years, the Naira continued to face challenges related to external factors, including oil prices and unfavorable economic policies. A few days ago, the Naira fell to an all-time low against the US dollar by exchanging about 1,000 Naira to 1,150 Naira to 1 US dollar. Since the Naira has no religion, tribe or tongue to the citizens of Nigeria, saving the Naira is now a necessity for survival. Joining us now on the show to discuss ways of saving the Naira is Professor Pat Utomi, a professor of political economy and management expert. Good morning, Professor Tommy, and welcome to The Morning Show. Good morning. Glad to join you. Thank you very much, sir. Well, I've just given a little, perhaps, history or background into the journey of the Naira and what we now call or what we uh, have tagged this morning as saving the Naira. The first question I'd like to ask you this morning is, how did we get ourselves here? And number two... The recent policy by this administration in terms of the unification of the um, foreign exchange, the floating of the Naira, I would love to get your assessment on that. Time-wise, um, practical, pragmatic, and the uh, you know, attendant effect on the Naira. Well, thank you very much. You know, I, I wish that Nigerians could discuss this challenge with the same passion that Kayode and Rufai were discussing Chelsea and uh, Arsenal and Co. We would have solved this problem a long time ago. <laughs> the truth okay. of the matter is that... <laughs> that is interesting, bro. Okay. I'm going to spare you. Prof, oh, you are a violent man, bro. You are a very violent professor. <laughs> we will discuss the economy the way we discuss okay. Arsenal and Chelsea. Don't worry. Let's go on. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, when I look at what's happening, it's, it's deja vu. I watched this happen to Zimbabwe. Uh, as a graduate student living in the United States, uh, uh, Robert Mugabe arrived and was on morning television, on Sunday morning television, I thought it was Face the Nation or one of those, uh, on a Sunday morning in 19, I don't know, 80 or 79. We were all so full of, you know, we were so proud as Africans. And I watched Mugabe run the Zimbabwe dollar to where it got to. You all know how it traveled. And I'm watching the Naira go in the same way, and I'm amazed that we are surprised at where the Naira is. In fact, we're lucky that it is where it is. We watched it, and it, the history was nicely provided in summary, but let me uh, return to this. In 1979, the Iranian Revolution began to run. I came home from the U.S., uh, in 1980, and I remember 
a remarkable thing on that trip. At JFK, I, I saw a Time or Newsweek magazine cover story, the world over a barrel. That was the first time that oil prices hit $40. It was unthought of. It was unheard of. And when I arrived in Lagos, you could tell what oil prices were. People were literally demented in their partying. The streets, through Larry, where I grew up, you couldn't move around because every street was blocked for a party. Uh, people were drinking canned beer that they could not pronounce the name of and tossing the thing out of the, 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 the window of the bus. And Lagos became the world's biggest dustbin, one huge dustbin, and so on and so forth. Um, the truth of the matter is that leadership failure over the years did not allow us to anticipate what we should have done and done it when we should have done it. I know that what we're trying to deal with now is firefighting, as we always do. Um, let me go back to the experience of Norway. Okay, Norway is too far away. Let's talk about Botswana. People forget that Botswana, between 1968 and 1980, was probably the fastest growing economy in the world based on diamond exports. What did Botswana do? Botswana saved a significant part of its earnings and put it in a future fund. And so for a long time, they're going to be drawing on returns from that fund to keep Botswana running even if they don't sell any diamonds. And so what did we do? We got in a drunken rage. We subsidized everybody's bad habit. And then... The last eight years in our country's history, a real tragedy. And I, I don't think people understand how much of a tragedy the Buhari years uh, were, you know. Now, the troubles in 1982, for um, two weeks, Nigeria did not sell one barrel of crude oil. Signal. Uh, and we then run, ran into a structural logjam. That was when the IMF talk going to the IMF for relief and all of that started. Long story short, we eventually played political games and settled for what was called a structural adjustment program on the Babangida. Now, what was SAP supposed to do? I mean, there were failings in how we managed it, which is also the problem we have right now in how we manage it. Now, we, we keep forgetting that economic development and progress is not just about mechanical things they do at the central bank and it's about values. It's about who we are, how we live it, and how people see that. And so, when we got a structural adjustment, we're talking subsidy, no subsidies, there were things we could have done that we didn't do because we just fell into the Washington consensus. Um, okay, they say we should do this. We have misbehaved. Let's just say, do what they say we'll do. We killed our educational system. Now we're talking about people transferring money for school fees. I went to the University of Nigeria. I got as good education as anybody who went to an Ivy League school in the United States got at the University of Nigeria. When I went off to grad school, there was no question. I mean, my American classmates who came from those kinds of schools didn't know anything better than me because of the schools they went to. But how we responded to SAP included not protecting our university system in the name of a kind of laser fair, but that's all part of that history. So today now, nobody, I have to admit, even I, was reluctant to send my own children to the same university that I, I was so proud to have gone to. So they have to go abroad, we have to spend all this money trying to send. In those days, we thought the smartest ones stayed in Nigeria, the ones who couldn't make it went abroad. And you only went abroad in, at a graduate school uh, 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 level. But we watched all of these things happen. We began to get into a foreign exchange crisis when Central Bank could not pay due uh, uh, um, debts. Uh, banks, foreign banks that had provided Nigeria with um, credit to their correspondent banks, you know, 
it's normally international uh, trade and transactions, began to stop it because when bills were due, Central Bank did not meet its obligations. That is what forced us into a structural adjustment program. At the heart of this whole conversation is production, produce, sell, exchange, and you can actually transact because you have the reserves to pay for your bills when they are due. Let me use an illustration of how India got into this kind of uh, scenario. Uh, India, because of the kind of policies it adopted, Nehru Gandhi dynasty, ended up technically bankrupt. By 1991, India had only three weeks in its foreign reserves. What happened? Unfortunately, but fortunately for India in many ways, instead of in Gandhi transmission, Rajiv Gandhi got killed in this assassination. And so a placeholder was put as in place for the uh, Gandhi Nehru dynasty. And this was an old man called Rao. Natsiman Rao then picked Mamahon Singh as finance minister. India began a set of reforms in 1991 that led, targeted non-resident Indians, the, 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 the diaspora, and all of that. By 1994, India's foreign reserves were going up at a point by about a billion uh, uh, dollars a week or something like that. I used to make a joke in one of my classes about the biggest flow of uh, dollars into India coming from a village in Nigeria, and the people will stop, say, what village? I say, Nri. What, Nri? Nri cannot feed itself, how can it be sending money to India? And I will say, okay, non-resident Indians, NRI. Uh, so, we have come to where India got to in 1991. The question is, what should we do? Uh, we tried to build a foreign exchange market. It was not an easy build with SAP. Why, why was this foreign exchange market important to build? So that the shenanigans of people advantage and have these multiple exchange, these exchange rates, uh, black market, and all of that. I, I, I don't know. The story is so... I, I want to tell you so many things. I don't know how much time I have. In 1993, I was at INSEAD. I was a famous professor of global finance called Ingo Walter. He was teaching a, a, a class on global finance, looking at exchange rates. If you looked at Latin America, it was crazy around that time. If you looked at Asia, you could see a close flow between the purchasing power parity line and the currencies. There wasn't much currency overshooting. They put Africa on the board, and one country just went out off the graph, Nigeria. It was crazy. And everybody began to laugh in the class. Now, after that experience, Nigeria struggled to create a proper market. Mm. Went through iterations so that yeah. you won't be hit in, in, in the, you know, like, like a boss hit you. Okay. So went through a second tier foreign exchange market, yeah. as firm and all of that, and eventually built up a market. Mm. And what happened? The last central bank demolish that for no reason, just to make some people be able to steal money. And, and, and so we are where we are, and people are By that, acting surprised. Yeah. Yes. My okay, friends, Prof. It, it, values it, shape human progress. Yes. Okay, so Prof, go uh, ahead, go at ahead, that go ahead, point ahead, yeah. where you are right there, first I must say I am so delighted, so happy to see you looking well, we thank God. And um, it's a joy to see you being willing Thank to you. throw darts at uh, Rufai and myself. Thank you very much for that. We won't forget, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> we won't forget. We we'll always remember the dart you threw at us. <laughs> but let me move to the issue, Prof. Yes, let me move to the issue. Now, um, yeah. a number of um, experts, economic experts, um, they've been saying that the reason Nigeria's problem escalated and went in the southward direction was because uh, under President Buhari, uh, Governor Emefiele was handling not just monetary policy, he focused extensively on fiscal policy because of the failure of the government of President Buhari. 
One question I'd like to ask, mm. the first one, will be, do you see a change in that trajectory with Yemi Kadoso as the new governor of CBN? Uh, especially when you hear some criticism by some people saying that it shouldn't be the Yemi Kadoso governorship that should be talking about uh, the lifting of ban on any product or anything that we're buying from anywhere. Importation should, shouldn't be his responsibility. That's one. Then the second issue will then be that in terms of where we are with our dollars now, what should be the primary focus of both the CBN and the government in terms of how we begin to generate the revenue that makes it possible for Naira to have strength. Because every economist I've spoken with, they said we have to be able to have products that are exported and we get revenue back in dollars or in pounds or in yen. How do we begin to do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, both Godwin Emefile and Yemi Caruso are good friends of mine. I completely sometimes disagree with what people do. And I can say publicly that I confronted Godwin Emefile when he began to deal with fiscal policy and said to him, that's not your business. And he said to me, but nobody's doing anything. So he felt he saw himself as some kind of, but that was a very mistaken view of, uh, of Messiah. It was a disaster. It was wrong. And... Uh, now they're saying to Yemi, oh, he's not saying anything. I said, no, central bank governors don't talk. Please, he should not be saying anything. Uh, look, Lee Pemberton, as governor of the Bank of England, was so, you know, his tongues were so, you know, that people used to joke that if you have to know what's happening in Bank of England, look at the movement of his eyebrows, because he had very thick eyebrows. Part of the mistake Godwin made was making himself the, the man who talked about the economic manager. It was a wrong thing. Central bank has very clear, clear, clear duties, and you have to get those, those right. So they made that mistake. When they went to multiple exchange rate to favor friends because they were getting political, they destroyed the foreign exchange market, which is really what I was uh, leading up, up to. How do we reconstruct that? All the economists who talk to you are right. It's about production. It's about earning income. In this emergency situation, there are a number of things that we can do. Uh, but you see, eh, none of them will work if people don't have confidence in Nigeria and the managers of Nigeria. You can do all you want. Nigeria has a legitimacy crisis in the world, let's face it. We need to sit down and deal with that problem. If we don't deal with it, you can only have these I don't know what to call them, things that don't last, you know, uh, moment slash. There's no cleverness in policy that will sustain general confidence in, in the country. And right now, it doesn't exist. So if we begin to leave certain values that this is really, and people can see it. I mean, you can't be talking about, we have this exchange uh, 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 rate crisis. You are buying cars for members of National Assembly. People say these people are not serious. Look at how Prof uh, General Obasanjo reacted when um, uh, uh, oil prices came down in 1977 or something like that as head of state, bang, he went down to Pujo 504 as the official car of the head of state. And everybody else was from that level down. And these guys are not behaving like there's fire on their mount. The world will not take you seriously if that's the kind of way you run your country. And nobody will throw you any slack or anything if you are behaving like that. So we must go into serious cost cutting across the board. I would even send the National Assembly on suspension for six months. Quite frankly, I don't think they're adding any value. Uh, and remove all their costs. And then we'll go to... The more important point about producing for export. We know that many people are not producing anything because they abandoned the farms and are in IDPs. We know that those who even make an effort to export, the customs people make it impossible for them to export. Look, years ago, two friends of mine, one, a former chief of air staff, retired at that time, and a former uh, executive from industry, 
were growing food nearby Otter here for export. In pain, they had to withdraw from the business after a while because you know how time ban bad food is. They're trying to get you to the airport. The customs guys will disappear, do all kinds of things to make you miss your deadline so you can give them something. And in doing that, the export possibilities were killed. If we are serious now, this is the time to move in. If we have to fire all these guys, fire them and ensure that people can really export. You can produce, get your, your, your stuff to Muta Mohammed three hours after. It will be on the shelves in London the following morning. We must work okay. at all those kinds of things happening. But okay, we have bro. to have a national strategy. National strategy. Okay, bro. And that national strategy, in my view, has to be based on latent comparative advantage of, on our factor endowments on certain value chains that we want okay. to dominate. Uh, okay, Rufai. Prof, uh, so I like the word you said, comparative advantage, because, you see, we just say things in a very funny way in this country. Nigeria should export for dollar. Where do we have comparative advantage? Uh, <laughs> Example, if we yes. keep talking about Ajaokuta, can Ajaokuta all of a sudden start to compete mm. with the likes of Liberty Steel? Mm. Who steel will they buy first? Where's the comparative advantage? I want you to talk more about mm. five to ten products that we can export that we have comparative advantage that can at least give us 20 billion in receipt mm. revenue, number one, if we can have that. Mm. Secondly, sir, mm. I want us to precisely go deep into the issue as we speak now of our forex. What are the next five steps mm -hmm. we can do to save our forex? Because reality on ground says, based on the mid medium term expenditure framework, that in the next three years, we'll still have to borrow 26 trillion for spendings. Mm. And that, if you add that to the either to 87 trillion we'll have, our debt will top over 100 trillion. Vis a vis the fact that our GDP, from the time of rebasing under good luck, Jonathan, to 500 billion, is now 395 billion. Mm. So, mm. how do we solve this uh, dollar problem? Three to four steps, quick wins as we speak now. And five mm. products that we can get comparative okay. advantage on, sir. Mm. Okay, let me begin with the how to solve the immediate problems. Again, I will preface everything I say. If people don't see our values, our commitment, not that we're all coming to look for opportunity to steal our own, none of this will work. So it, it has to be, first of all, the political class has to get together and realize their country is about to die. You know, like a war cabinet. Do you, do you think President Chinubu understand this, Nigeria. sir? Do you think President Tinubu has shown willingness to do uh, this? Well, I don't know. But if he doesn't, Nigeria is dead. Period. I can tell you that. You don't need a soothsayer. So, so it, this is not business as usual. Country is on the, on the cusp of kaput. But let me go into the heart of, of, of the matter. I think that... What uh, the crown prince did in Saudi Arabia is a very important thing to do right now. Got to grab these guys. Oh, we're talking subsidy, this, this, this. People have billions of dollars. Nigerians, I don't know what they're doing with them, but they stack them all out there. If this judgment comes in today, uh, 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 on this case in London, and they really go heavily against Nigeria, we're technically bankrupt as a country. So, knowing that this is where we are, you got to get all these guys who have you know, put all this money out there, lock them up in Federal Palace Hotel for one week, cough something out, or <laughs> we all go down together in this ship. Um, so that's one strong uh, 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 view. There are different iterations of how you can get what out of them. But Nigeria is a country that has been in state capture and held hostage by a few people, and they have money they don't know what to do with. Um, Two, our assets. Look, um, NMPC is a complete mess. In 1977, 19, sorry, 19, what, 1996, I keep going back to a, a, a conversation I have researching a, a book that I published in 98, titled Managing Uncertainty. 
with the immediate past group managing director of NMPC, Dr. Thomas John. And I said to him, look, why don't we use this kind of model? That model became what the NA eventually saved the NLNG. But I had suggested that model for NMPC in 1996. And uh, Dr. John joked, you know, when I talked about privatizing NMPC, he said, ah, is NMPC not privatized? I said, ah, when did it happen? How did I miss that? He said, ah, it's, it's, NMPC has always been privatized. The problem is that those who own it did not pay for it. Uh, the truth of the matter is that we can take these national assets, even look at our shareholding in NLNG, which is probably one of the most successful companies on the continent today, and we go to the London Stock Exchange, the York Stock Exchange, whatever, and list NLNG. And we can pledge a percentage of that value that has come out of NLNG and use it to show up financing if we are going to get all that new money coming in into real productive assets, not to go and borrow to steal, as we have done in the last eight years particularly. Then we can really jumpstart production. And when we then begin to jumpstart production, the question is, what are our factor endowments in which we have what structural economics today refers to as latent comparative advantage on which we can build these value uh, 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 chains? I would go, my favorite, one of my favorite examples, sesame seed. In, in the north central of Nigeria, they use it to make soup. I know they enjoy their soup. But we can grow it so much and process it and export it Target, say, all the McDonald's ham hamburger chains in one or two countries in Europe alone to supply the sesame seed on the bond. And that will be hundreds of thousands of new jobs in Nigeria and millions of dollars in exchange uh, revenue. Um, all the other parts of the value chain of sesame seed, the, the oil and all of that go. We can go to rubber, something that I argued when I was in industry. Again, people who don't have the, uh, if you will, discipline of thinking uh, uh, come to this. The day I was hired to work for Volkswagen of Nigeria, I wrote a piece that appeared in this, this week, which is the predecessor of this day. And I said, look, if I had my chance, I would shut down Volkswagen of Nigeria. And people thought, this guy is crazy. <laughs> You've just been hired to work for this company. You say you will shut it down. And I said, yes. The only person who, well, not the only person, one person who got what I was trying to say was then Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, he called me and said, you make sense, but that kind of courage is not n normal in this country. And my argument was, don't try and assemble cars in Nigeria at this time. We have no comparative advantage in it. What we should do is take a couple of components in the motor car, say like rubber, where we have serious comparative advantage. Grow rubber across southern Nigeria as if it was the only thing. Have a deal with Peugeot, with Volkswagen, with all these companies, Damla Benz, Damla Chrysler, whatever they were at that time. Uh, 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 and take three, four rubber components and become the primary supplier into their global supply chains. Who will make 20 times more money than we're making from crude oil. Who would have jobs of quality. And the terms of trade disadvantage we get with commodities we will not deal with there. But Nigeria just refuses to sit down to do this hard work, the thinking. Uh, at least just want to quickly, you know, gain short-term personal advantage and live beyond their means. So, so you take a, a, a rubber there. You take uh, other agricultural produce because most of our uh, uh, comparative advantage today would be in agricultural produce, but even oil. You can turn the hydrocarbons value chain and look at what you can do. Look at what has happened with Indorama. In, I mean, the petrochemicals were a mess. They sold to the Indians. Look what they've done uh, with Indorama. We can take the hydrocarbons value chain. Now that we are in energy transition, that crude oil may become less and less a major revenue source, but hydrocarbons processed can still be a major source 
of revenues in the fertilizer business and so on and so forth. So we can go through all of these and seriously apply ourselves, bring in hungry entrepreneurs. I don't mean fat cats. You know what we do when we do these things? We have to bring one fat cat who's looking for somewhere to extract rent. The way that General Park did with young engineers in South Korea back in those days, and say, you, you're an engineer in the, the marine business. How can we get you to become a major shipbuilder? Ah, oh, okay, if I'm going to be a major shipbuilder, uh, then I need to get a steel at this kind of price. Ah, steel producers, what will it take for you to get steel at this kind of price? Ah, then the banks must not charge us more than this kind of interest rate. And collectively, everybody worked their way through how an industrial policy that will support that process will work. I, I, I'm saying that people like Jeju Chang uh, at Cambridge uh, uh, may argue about bad Samaritans, right. but let's not get ourselves uh, uh, hooked in that. Let us look at, you know, our ability to do just small industrial policy, not the big import substitution, ban this, ban that. No. All right. Take those areas where we have this uh, uh, latent comparative advantage All right. and add value on limited industrial policy over a few years and become globally competitive and dominant on those value chains. Brilliant. That must be the strategy we, we have to go, go for. Thank you so much, Professor Otomi. We're still going to continue this conversation with you because there's still many areas to explore. However, at this point, we'd like to go on a very quick break. And then when we come back, we'll continue to speak with Professor Pat Utomi on saving the Naira. It's still the morning show here on Arise News. And for the break, we're speaking with Professor Pat Utomi, a professor of political economy and management expert. We're still speaking to him. And the topic before us this morning is saving the Naira. We have looked at issues around the floating of the Naira, its effect on the value of the Naira, looked at uh, revenue generation, and also touched on leadership a bit. I'd like to um, center on that, Professor Utomi, in terms of my next question to you this morning. Um, former President Olusha Gwambasanjo over the weekend was speaking at an Afrexim Bank event. And it makes the front page of the This Day newspaper, actually. And it was talking about a number of issues. One of which he talked about, and, and it's what you had started to speak to um, following Rufai's question, around what is now being described as the curse of the oil, the discovery of oil. Because what, has, what that has now turned Nigeria to be is to be a mono um, product economy. So we're not focusing or diversifying to tap into our other rich resources. I mean, the focus on that conference was on agriculture. So he was talking about the prospects in agriculture as with our other abundant resources. He also looked at trade and why Nigeria is such a small player on the global scale when it comes to um, exporting our manufactured goods. Only 1.9% is what we account for on the global stage. And one of these he attributed to the fact that we export without adding value largely to a number of our products. Even crude oil, which is our mainstay, is export, exported as is without any value. And then we end up importing most of our petroleum resources, you know, the, the um, resources from um, products from crude oil. So we have fundamental issues. And he, he believes that we can easily turn around our nation from being a mono economy to a, you know, to diversify. And he cited countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, who also were dependent on one um, product, but now have diversified. What is our main challenge, number one? How can we begin to, because we have all these, um, we have NEPSI, Nigeria Export Promotion Council. We have a number of these bodies that are set up to look into, you know, exportation, but we haven't still been able to cut it, to get it right. What are the challenges and how can we begin to tap into, you know, these rich resources that we have, especially adding value to our raw products? Well, <clears throat> thank you so, so very much for uh, moving to that subject. And I, I was actually, uh, if you will, drifting towards it. Uh, we have to be honest with ourselves. When I keep talking about values, 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 I am not 
being a moralist or anything. It's got very little to do with morals. Morals are fantastic. But the truth of the matter is that values shape human progress. All of these things we failed in because of corruption. Corruption and corruption. Our institutions have been weakened and are continue to be weakened by a political class that is not ready to work. They just want to corruptly enrich themselves. And so they will send people who don't have the competencies to run those institutions that you have mentioned. Uh, 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 and even when they send people who seem to be anywhere near capable, they then harass them so much that the people just get exhausted. I have a classmate who used to run one of the uniform services in Nigeria. At a point in time, he chose to retire a year ahead of time because he was fed up with National Assembly breathing down his neck to balloon budgets, do this, do that, do that. He thought he just needed his peace to go away. Um, I have, I mean, look at Yewande Sadiku. Look at what he, she experienced. He took up, took up people who have competence, trying to go into those kinds of, so how are you going to get those things to happen when you have this kind of political class that does not even know that what it is doing is damage to its own future? They're so short term in their, what they can grab that they just prevent Nigeria from growing as an economy. Um, in, in, in responding to Rufai's um, five and probably giving three or four, I, I saw an ad during the break from AfriExim Bank for the Intra-African Trade Fair, which is sometime next a month in, in Cairo. And I recall at the last one in Cairo, uh, a young Nigerian, one of my mentees, entrepreneurs, and he, his thing was about date palm. The guy lives in Lagos, uh, Dr. Suleiman, and he goes and gets dates, processes date palm. And the value chain from date palm alone, if you then think of date grown in Niger and all of those areas, and you were to build a hub in, I don't know, Sokoto or somewhere around there, and made that the center for aggregating dates, processing, adding to the value chain of dates across African borders. And this is why AFTA is there. You know, by, by the way, I, I, I serve as chair of uh, the private sector, uh, uh, PAFTRAC, uh, Pan-African Trade and Investment uh, a committee supposed to advise African heads of state on these matters. And, and you, you just see what we're losing. Africa contributes less than 3% of global trade. How are you going to cont cont uh, contribute more if you have these small pockets of, uh, okay, poor Dr. Suleiman can do 100 liters of date palm here. You say to Walmart or whoever, I'd like to supply you, and they will say, we need one million, I don't know, tons a week. Are you going to be able to do that? No. You can only do that when you can aggregate and aggregate across borders. And these are the things that we should create the environment for and then encourage young entrepreneurs to produce into. And you can then uh, uh, become a major earner of foreign exchange. Look at how the, the Japanese and the, and the Koreans approach that. They created this huge trading companies like the Marubenis of this world, whose essential duty is aggregation. You know, uh, uh, you know many of you buy fancy clothes from Versace, London High Streets, and all of that. But who produces those things? Versace doesn't produce them, really. Versace organizes small Italian families who do quality leather work, quality these luxury products, and they just aggregate, put the Versace brand on it, and sell it for incredible amounts of money. Of course, those small Italian families are happy. They're earning very well and living well, thank you. But Versace is smiling all the way to the bank uh, with much more in terms of the margins that they're adding. We have to be able to do those things and do them uh, uh, in, in dimensions that... But corruption is not letting us do it. The big man who wants to buy his next Mercedes... Who wants to uh, pay for his flat in London? He's politically influential. So he gets in the way of Ewande Sadiku's work. I don't know what happened with Ewande, but I know that this is the kind of thing that happens. And it has prevented Nigeria from diversifying the base of this economy. For me, one of the reasons I stopped 
reacting to budgets in Nigeria, was a standard line in budget speeches to, for 30 years was to diversify the monocultural economy. They read it like, a, and I say, oh my goodness, I heard this last year, I heard it two years ago, I heard it three years ago. But what practically was being done? Nothing. And part of the reason was corruption. Because we have a lazy, rent-seeking elite that doesn't want to produce, doesn't want to work to earn its keep. And so I, I think that this business of diversifying the base of the economy is at the heart of where we go forward from. And the possibilities are around the discussion we had earlier of a national strategy. Do we have a national strategy? No, we don't. And I would dare to side with Justin Lin, uh, uh, the Chinese economist, uh, that what we need to do is take our factor endowments where we have relative comparative advantage, take from amongst those, have a limited industrial policy around them and try to dominate certain global value chains. That way we will diversify, like Rufai was asking, five, don't take everything. My approach was to take every part of Nigeria, what are their endowments, and there's no part of this country, whether they're in the desert or on the ocean, that does not have endowments then take that particular endowment, take the advantage that we have in it, construct value chains, educate even the primary school education of kids who live in Bedway State should include farming and processing sesame seed. And by the time the kid is 16 years old, he or she can actually run a business that is one part of the arm of sesame seed uh, 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 processing and export and they can be well off without going to university and study something they don't even understand uh, or doesn't add any value uh, 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 and so so much needs to be done from our educational system to the mindset of political political actors reviving the policy process I'm right here stuck in the middle of uh, a book I'm hoping will be out by February uh, uh, I call it the 4P books uh, politics, power, public policy, and performance. And, and it's really about this kind of stuff, uh, that we're not performing because the political uh, and power uh, processes are affecting public policy in a way that we can't consistently focus on what will make our country prosperous. We just wait for the easy money that comes from oil, and we share it in some manner. A few of us at the top somewhere, and the rest of the country lives in poverty. That's how you get to be the poverty capital of the world when you have all these kinds of endowments. Yeah. And the time to stop that nonsense is now. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning, Professor Pater Tom. You've shared some really insightful um, perspective on the topic this morning. And as you've mentioned, we can give suggestions, recommendations. At the end of the day, political will and leadership is key to making that difference. Well, thank you for your time this morning. Mm -hmm.